this is. Yeah, dear Chairman, dear Professor Berger, thank you very much for the invitation. I got the task to summarize in the next 15, 18 minutes um, what could be the evidence for pharmacological treatment in the myocardium of congenital heart disease. First of all, I have nothing to do with those patients. Usually I'm an interventional cardiologist, uh, let's say heart failure specialist for those who have not congenital heart disease, but I know that we have similarities. First of all, the dilemma, due to the success of uh, the treatment of coronary heart diseases, we are producing a lot of patients with heart failure, let's say, so far those who are survivors. In similar success, what we usually have with our cath interventions, we have also in the field of congenital heart disease. If you see here, um, in the years 87, 88, the, the death components of those uh, new childs was very, very high, and due to an improvement of treatments, we have now here the opposite, similar to that what we have in the non-congenital heart disease parts, that we have more and more growing uh, patients who are survivors, but develop probably in addition uh, secondary forms of heart failure. However, if we like to compare that, we have sure severe differences. So my patients very often have a myocardial infarction. They were for a long, long time asthmatic, and they have probably no myocardial dysfunction for a long time until they had a sudden myocardial infarction. Similar, the progress of the de decline of cardiac function in those with dilated cardiomyopathy probably due to a myocarditis or valvular diseases. On congenital heart disease, it's completely different. You have the survivors of the born, early surgical population and or repair, and then probably in late onset of complications needing reoperations. And that has probably also an impact on pathophysiological mechanisms and probably um, pharmacological treatment um, opportunities. What could be that what we can do probably at least with medica medications and that's cases of coronal heart diseases. I think one of the first tasks should be the delay of onset of symptoms, at least the reduction of heart failure symptoms, and of course at the end an improved survival. However, this is absolutely difficult to control and we have probably not enough knowledge to take that what we know from patients with a myocardial infarction just by an one-to-one -one transplantation to these kind of situations. <clears throat> so what are specific determinants in adult uh, congenital heart failure. Survivors have specific cardiac pulmonary residual since initial interventions are not curative. Shunts, valve failure, left ventricular hypertrophy, ischemia, direct myocardial defects are um, often not completely corrected. So we have a very heterogenic population with a variety of defects and non -dif of different degrees, and most of them are unique, are not parallel to that what I say I see with my patients after, for instance, myocardial infarctions. So let's go a little bit to the pathophysiological mechanisms, and uh, I don't understand. Um, please accept that I have not the possibility to go to all the details, probably just some of them to understand what kind of difference we have here. So my cardiac architecture of the right ventricle, first of all, we have to know that the architecture of the left and the right ventricle following the development of the heart is quite different. So we have first heart fields and second heart fields. The second heart fields in, blonde, in, in blue are probably more uh, representative for that one we see uh, and is important for the development of the right ventricle, and also the signaling here is quite different between the right and the left ventricle. And I tell you that because it's important. In my patients, in most of the cases, I have to deal with patients who have a left ventricular failure. And those with the congenital heart disease is much more prominent. We have problems on the right heart side. And you see that here, that even if we look through the architecture and dependent on the different forms of congenital heart disease, we have probably in the right ventricle differences in the rest this disrupted endomysium. You have these struts and fibrosis, a lot of fibrosis. So drugs are not really available to come over that kind of uh, changes and differences. Furthermore, 
um, both ventricles behave under stress conditions quite different. So we have uh, a lot of compensation mechanisms uh, in respect of the left ventricle when this ventricle is at stress with respect to an, an increase of antioxidant enzymes and angiogenesis, which then probably fail or fall. And these reserve mechanisms are principally failing when we have a right ventricular uh, um, pressure overload uh, situation. Last but not least, also the left ventricle probably is very often different to that what we know for patients with myocardial infarctions. Here data also with a group from Professor Berger showing that we have a high uh, prevalence of um, um, non-compaction in addition in patients with congenital heart disease and um, up to date there are no specific treatments available here. And this is not just a question of genetic approaches. We believe that probably changes of pressure especially during the development of the, of the heart, are able to, to disturb the compaction mechanisms of the left ventricle. So taking all this together, probably we see in addition that ischemia could be something which is more prominent in early stages until then the end <coughs> stages of congenital heart diseases. You see that here's an, uh, an example for the myocardial perfusion defects, very often um, to find a long-term follow-up after artery switch operations. And you see that here that ischemia in the right ventricle occurs in that kind of patients compared to, um, let's say, healthy patients. Neurohumoral activation, extremely important because neurohumoral activation is the target of heart failure in the patient group I'm treating with myocardial infarction. The question is whether all patients with congenital heart disease have really also an activated renin, angiotensin, and or na um, natriuretic peptide system because our drugs are targeting this. And we know that this is not every time the case, and this is not every time the case in each stage of the patients. So BNP and NBNP can be a therapeutic target. I come to that a little bit later. But we use that usually also as a biomarker or a prognostic marker. You see here data for uh, patients with Eisenmenger syndrome. There is probably BNP activation helpful ident to identify this patient, but this cannot be generalized. So studies regarding neurohumoral activation are small with limited follow-up, and it's importantly to, that they do not show an abstraction by biomarkers in all of these patients. Last but not least, look at here, the negative and positive predictive value to use these markers to, to guide um, therapy under these conditions is even um, extremely limited, and especially the positive predictive value is low. Let's come to um, the other points when we have seen here these that we see myocardial ischemia is also triggering troponin and probably also fibroblast activation fibrosis is much more important in, in congenital heart disease than for instance in dilatative cardiomyopathy. You see that here and when you have volume overload or pressure overload um, that of course the interstitial spaces is increasing. You see that here that you can and see in MRIs, late enhancement and systemic right ventricles. And if we take these further in account, then you know that probably um, all of these diseases, up to 50%, you have an, uh, fibrosis approaches. However, this is not only local fibrosis, as I just had shown in the slide before. This is a diffuse fibrosis. And this has an extremely important impact. Um, what we have done is <clears throat> now we have taken biopsies from patients with heart failure. We have isolated the fibroblasts from these um, patient biopsies. And uh, well, that was probably not a surprise that if you stretch these isolated fibroblasts in that kind of stretched chambers, of course, they secrete and produce suddenly collagen. So far, so fine. Fibroblasts can produce fibrosis by themselves. But what I would like to show you is that this stretch um, <clears throat> means that these fibroblasts suddenly, they can also produce MCP. So they secrete chemokines. They, they heat up inflammatory processes. 
processes. And if I have a congenital heart disease with or without surgery repair, with ischemia due to the um, malperfusion of, of, of oxygen, and I know that they have these um, distinct fibrosis approaches, I know that fibrosis is due to these hemodynamic changes alone able to activate fibroblasts or myofibroblasts to induce fibrosis to have a cardiac dysfunction, and this probably also increases an inflammatory process, which of course is not targeted by any um, medications that we have already established. So this is a plenty of different forms which are extremely important. Some of them are parallel to those with patients with myocardial infarction. Some of them are unique in different forms of congenital heart diseases. So how to treat that, how to overcome that? So first of all, there's a statement, um, a paper by Stott et al. just uh, published, and they say, expectation of a benefit in patients with two ventricular circulation with systemic left ventricular dysfunction is okay and follow the guidelines of the ESC. So you see there are no real data available and everything what I'm doing with my patient with respect to primary left ventricular dysfunction can be probably also translated to at least such forms of congenital heart disease where you have a two ventricular circulation system. So what does that mean, what the guidelines are saying? The guidelines just came out uh, three, four months ago, and they say, of course, you need your diuretics to, um, uh, to deal with the relief of symptoms. You give an ACE inhibitor and beta blocker when the ejection friction is lower than 35, you come up with a an, uh, an mineral corticoid antagonist, and when this patient still has problems, the heart rate is higher than 70 beat per minute, and the sinus rhythm adds to the beta blocker and ivabradine. Look for the left rental block, uh, prove whether CRT is necessary or can be helpful under these conditions, or replace the ACE inhibitor with a new drug which is called uh, Entresto of the ARNI. ARNI is an, a new drug where you have uh, an 81 receptor antagonist together with an enzyme inhibitor in, which is inhibiting neprolysin. Neprolysin is an enzyme in the membrane of the vessels which prevents the breakdown of natriuretic peptides. And these natriuretic peptides breakdown has probably beneficial effects for the myocardium because you are activating the CGMP system which has cardiobeneficial and also antifibrotic effects. However, if you block neprolysine, you also prevent the breakdown of angiotensine II, and therefore you need the combination of NEP inhibition together with the AT1 receptor antagonist, in this case, Valsartan. This has been proven in patients with left ventricular dysfunction, not primary and congenital heart disease, and we have seen that in the ACE inhibitor was inferior to LC set in nearly all points of mortality, heart failures, prognosis, and so on and so on. Very important in this condition is that the mode of death was influenced. And that is the slide where I say, okay, that I can accept. When I have a new super renin angiotensin inhibitor, I would expect, of course, that the mode of action with respect to worsening of heart failure must be improved. But the probably very interesting point here is that the sudden death course was reduced. And that could have been also an impact on congenital heart disease, knowing that troponin, as I had shown you in the beginning, is very often increased due to the wall stress, and that we see also in our patient population, and due to as he said, troponin levels were reduced, and that could be in the course, and could be probably also important for patients with um, um, congenital heart diseases since troponin is known to be activated or, um, already in early stages of congenital heart disease. Last but not least, probably digoxine should be considered. I know that in, that in, uh, that in your field, digoxine is probably used uh, much more prominent and much more often. Uh, in my field, digoxine has more or less um, less good data, and therefore, we do not use that um, on, a, on a prominent way. So 
coming back to Stout, they, uh, they had said, okay, probably the guidelines I just had summarized are also very meaningful for congenital heart disease. We know that congenital heart disease never have a sta stage A. We start directly to stage B, and you see here the opportunities of that, what I had shown you before. Also seen in stage B and stage C, a patient with congenital heart disease. The ARNI had been here added by me and Dr. Berger, because at that time it was not clear whether it will find to the guidelines. We have here the typical exercise training programs and also that one we will hear later with respect to the pulmonary hypertension. Okay, so patients with a two ventricle circulation system probably have a benefit to that one we have here seen in the ESC guidelines. But how is the expectation in non-two ventricle circulation failures? What kind of data we have here in that kind of conditions? And there I think we have to have doubts that here in one-to-one -one translation is possible. And I would like to go you, with you through to the different pharmacotherapeutics experience, for instance, and those with systemic right ventricle. Um, so systemic right ventricular patients develop in up to 65% when they are older, symptomatic heart failure, arrhythmias, they need a pacemaker, fourfold increase of sudden death, and so on and so on. So all these targets which we address with the drugs, I have told you for those we are using with patients with myocardial infarction. But how is the evidence here? With renin-angiotensine inhibitors, small studies, no effect on the function of the right ventricle, P4O2. In some patients, they had probably in survival effect on an ACE inhibitor, but the question here whether this occurred due to the um, reduction of other comorbidities rather than a direct treatment of the patients <coughs> with uh, congenital heart disease. You see here Vazartan, after three years, no beneficial effect with ejection fraction, no effect on event-free survival. So the direct translation is not really possible of that. What, with, what we see with beta blockers, some more beneficial effects here with respect, for instance, to, do, to the clinical um, uh, behavior of the patients, but the new heart status uh, differences, I think, is really weak. Uh, however, reduction of symptoms had been shown in some of the studies, no data for survival on sudden death, one small study only in, sh in children. So if we take this form of congenital heart diseases, we have to say the best blockers we are using in heart failure, ACE inhibitors and beta blockers, there's no evidence that we really can recommend that for all patients. So a number of the studies, up to 30 patients, mostly asymptomatic patients had been studied, duration time very short, and we have inconsistent data. That is not what we have here. But let's come to the next point. I told you a 4.4 increase in sudden death. What do we know for defibrillator therapy? Primary prevention. 0.5 adequate shocks in those with TGA. Secondary prevention, 6% only adequate shocks. So this is, that was shocking by myself as I have realized that. And you see that here, at least for the right ventricle, that, um, the, the, the factors which we are using known from the left ventricle probably does not work under these conditions. And the role of CRD is also something while well, we don't know exactly, at least 30% of the patients have a left ventricle block. The effect is unclear. We have difficulties in the implantation. And so, so the role of CRD is not clear under these conditions. So, Bots et al. just have summarized that, and I would say only thing what he has summarized here is on an em em empirical view. So he says, an asymptomatic or symptomatic patient, this can be tested when the left ventricular ejection friction is lower than 40, that is fine. However, those with asymptomatic patients, since these drugs could also harm by disadvantages of a preload and afterload changes, no medical treatment under this condition is recommended. And from the view of the prevention, I'm really surprised, but the data, as I had shown you, does not let other options over. Um, let's come to the single ventricle and those uh, with the Fontaine disease. They also develop over the low time, long time heart failure, but they have additional problems with respect, for instance, to the hepatopathy or the coagulopathies. ACE inhibitors, no effect, even a study of 12 months. Small numbers with beta blockers, little benefit, more or less, sometimes neutral, sometimes neutral effects. So we have here also new data on these kind of conditions. And uh, pulmonary vasodilator therapies, we will hear that probably later, uh, are still under, under investigation. 
single ventricle on Fontaine with respect to defibrillators, untested. We have absolutely no data, with, also with respect to CRT, nearly no data. Empirical, it has been summarized by bots. Every time the same, you can do that. You do it more or less on the uh, empiric way. You give symptomatic diuretics in those patients who are congestive and asymptomatic patients. You just wait and see. Similar, subpulmonary right ventricular volume loading changes in these conditions. A benefit, at least, for those who had a TOF uh, for 65 patients, probably ACE inhibitors are beneficial also in restrictive right ventricle. However, the doses must be very carefully investigated in that kind of patients. Afterload and preload reductions are very sensitive. Um, better blockers probably harm under these conditions. So, what about defibrillators? We know that especially uh, sudden death in TOV is extremely important and up to 55%. Primary preventation, no data, pr principal thought that has a good prognosis. And then here probably to those who had been operated, secondary prevention could be helpful in these condition. If you see that here, new data showing that between primary and secondary prevention, the strategy to give an ICD does not lead to really changes under these conditions. So we need new risk factors for different parameters. So patients with myocardial infarction, they get in a primary prevention in um, ICD when the ejection fraction is of the left ventricle lower than 35, but this cannot be easily translated for that kind of diseases. Um, Whatever we do, we have only empirical um, recommendations and what is absolutely clear that we need more data, especially in single ventricle with a Fontaine repair and a normal left ventricle. We are not sure whether we harm or benefit from the patient. In asymptomatic patients, prevention of systemic right ventricle, we have nearly no data. What's going on when you have liver dysfunction? Sudden death certification does not help and role of CRT and also probably cardiac mortality mutation is still not clear. So what we need in the future, and I'm now coming to the drugs, what I'm looking for for my patients, and um, talking and thinking about what are the problems in your field, I would like to discuss with you at least some of them which could be important in these conditions. Let's start here, aldosterone antagonists. That is extremely important because the aldosterone antagonists are the only antifibrotic drugs we have, spironolactone and aplerinone, but we are not able to use them in high doses is due to the hyperkalemia or the uh, kidney uh, dysfunction. So phenerenone is a new aldosterone antagonist which is probably helpful under these conditions. Probably we need new diuretics like aquaretics. Um, CGMP act activators could be important in these conditions. To some, of, to some of them belongs also LCZ. I had shown you the data. SCSC stimulators can be helpful probably. There are some data available showing that Riosigo but at least in patients with diastolic heart failure and pulmonary hypertension, we have here probably a benefit, at least in my patients. What I really would like to see in patients with congenital heart diseases where only one ventricle is primarily impaired are probably the group of the so-called myosin activators. So they have not really severe um, hemodynamic um, effects with respect to pre and after loading changes. They have really a positive inotropic effect and that could be extremely important for those where you have to only to stimulate, for instance, with respect to the inotropy of the right ventricle. Of course, data aren't yet with, for instance, omega teeth are only available with respect to the left ventricular dysfunction. But the interesting part is this is the only positive um, inotropic drug which you can have as a pill. So it is oral available, and we have here the first data, for, at least for those patients with reduced ejection fraction, that you have here an improvement in function and also in remodeling with those with um, reduced left ventricular function. However, positive inotropy, that could be something which is probably important. Gentlemen, dear colleagues, I come to my conclusion. I think heart failure remains a common difficult and often final complication. Did I make something wrong? Very wrong? What I have said? 
Ladies, I do privately later. <laughs> Sorry for that, ladies. The first step must be to optimize myocardial remodeling with function with diagnosis and reversal of pressure and volume loading lesions, result little shunts and barrier or conduct malfunction. There's still a lack of data supporting guiding pharmacological therapy. The extrapolation is extremely difficult and probably only for some of the group of the patients available. And so we need randomized controlled trials, but that is difficult because the number of the patients is low and therefore we have to look for new specific drugs. Dear ladies, gentlemen, <laughs> And gentlemen, thank you very much for your attention.